Good morning and happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to Z Learning right here at Riverbanks Zoo and Garden. My name is Milo and today we are in for a very highly requested topic, our Riverbanks Conservation Outpost, or as many of you refer to affectionately, the tunnel here at Riverbanks. Now we're gonna be heading through here in just a moment. We're gonna stay on guest side this morning so you notice my mask is down under my chin. We're not gonna be interacting with keepers other than maybe through the glass viewing windows, but I wanted to pause out here quick to say good morning to everybody as you all tune on in. Good morning, Nolan. I am so glad to see you're excited. Hopefully the fishing cat is in view. Fingers crossed. Of course, we're going to see what our animals are doing first and foremost, but Nolan, my fingers are crossed for you and that fishing cat. I know you are oh so excited. Good morning, Ella, Jordan, Dempsey and Fisher. Good morning. Nice to see you. Diane, Faith. Oh my gosh. All of you regulars, Stacy, Anna, Abby and Pam. It is so nice to see all of you tuning in live this morning. Y'all are starting your week out right with us right here at River Manx. Ryan, Shea, nice to see you. Austin and Savannah as well. These are coming in way too fast. I can hardly keep track of them. Good morning from all of us here at Riverbanks. It is so nice to see all of you tuning in. Good morning, good morning. Now, like I said, here in a second, we're actually going to head into our Riverbanks Conservation Outpost. Now, a lot of the species we are going to see this morning are threatened, vulnerable, or even endangered or critically endangered. Now I know we spent last Friday focusing on our critically endangered gorilla troop. In fact, they're just down the pathway just behind me right here. But today we're gonna focus on some smaller residents here at Riverbanks, but I gotta say hi to all of you too. Ellie, I love that you're wearing your South Carolina strong shirt, your Riverbank shirt. Oh, that's amazing to hear. Sarah, good morning. Stevie, Cameron, nice to see all of you tuning in. Michael and Dylan as well. Oh, Good morning, and it is so great. I wanna say I'm losing track now, but I think this is our ninth full week of Z Learning features, and all of you are still tuning in. It is so amazing for us to bring riverbanks into your homes, whether it's our animals or our plants. We gotta say good morning and give you a big, solid welcome. I am so excited. Y'all are as excited as I am because like I said, this has probably been one of our most requested areas to head into. We visited sea lions, tortoises, gorillas, but you know what? Y'all want to go here. Let's turn it around. You know where I'm talking about, Riverbanks Conservation Outpost. We are over here on the meerkat side of the Riverbanks Conservation Outpost but we call it affectionately here RCO. So it's just an acronym RCO to abbreviate the area, but we will have the space to ourselves and we're actually going to kind of make our way into the area. It's a nice sunny day, but of course we're immediately greeted right here by our ring-tailed lemur troop. Now you can't miss those iconic tails. Let's go ahead and see if we can zoom in. I know it might be a little challenging to see through the mesh this morning but we have three ring-tailed lemurs here at Riverbanks. These are one of my absolute favorite characters. Now, those of you who are familiar with lemurs or maybe are animal nerds like I am, <laughs> ring-tailed lemurs are only found in one part of the world. I'm not gonna say it. I want some of you to comment. Where are ring-tailed lemurs found? And actually, where are all lemurs found? They're found in only one place in the entire world they're very specialized species. I wanna see that coming through. There's over 300 of you tuning in. Where are lemurs found? Help me out. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to see you. Our lemurs have been missing out on seeing all these people. Everyone's just wondering what is going on. Christina, thank you so much. I was waiting on the edge of my seat. Christina and Julia, you commented in with the right answer. Lemurs are found in Madagascar. Now, if you are looking at a map of the world, Madagascar is the large island on the east coast of Africa. It's a very significant island. But I will say though, even though all lemur species are found in that one centralized location of Madagascar, they are very much so threatened with habitat deforestation and fragmentation of their habitat. So many lemur species are actually considered threatened or endangered out in the wild, unfortunately. Oh, here come in all those answers. Thank you so much. Crystal, Gunner, Chase, you all know where they're from. Rylan, you know where they're all found on that island of Madagascar. 
Now, right now we are looking specifically at our ring-tailed lemurs. And in a little bit, we're actually gonna make our way through the entire tunnel and head on over to another lemur species that we have here at Riverbanks, our red ruffed lemurs as well. Oh, here it comes Jaden, Jenny, Austin. Y'all are on top of it. Andrea, Madagascar, you got it. Y'all are on the ball. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna scroll through past all those answers. Y'all got it correct. Ooh, ooh. They started to call just a second ago, right as I was talking. I'm trying to not be so wobbly. I'm just so excited to be here in the River Rings Conservation Outpost. But lemurs are actually a very loud individual. In fact, for many, many years, people of Madagascar actually refer to them as the ghosts of Madagascar. A lot of lemur species are actually nocturnal, not specifically ring-tailed lemurs, but because they would call in the evening, they would almost sound like these kind of eerie ghost-like calls. Now, if you've ever been here at Riverbanks, when the lemurs are actually calling is very, very loud, especially our red ruff lemurs. So if I have to pause and let them have the microphone, you know, they're just gonna do their thing because there is no way I'm going to speak over them this morning. But you can see, actually, I gotta point this out too. This is kind of bizarre. You don't see this every day at Riverbanks, but you see that kind of big blue structure right there in the middle? That's actually a big blanket or a sheet actually has been tied up as enrichment for our lemurs. They have all this fresh browse all around too that they can either nibble on if they want to or smell, sniff, and scent mark on. Lemurs are really big into scent marking, but the big kind of parachute shape, that's where they have for enrichment for today at least. Oh, Andrea was wondering, do they have a baby? No, we do not have any baby ring-tailed lemurs right now. But speaking of babies, we are actually going to make our way through the tunnel. One of the furthest habitats from where we are right now is actually where our infant squirrel monkey lives. Now, we have another squirrel monkey that is hanging out in here. We might be able to see just past the reflection here. We'll head over and visit the rest of our troop. Somebody has a handful of snacks. But you can see all that fresh browse as well. There we are, now he's coming down. Here, let's see if I can kind of zoom in a little bit. Somebody has not seen visitors for a long time and is very curious. Unfortunately though, my phone is trying to focus. There we go, much better view. So Frankie, Shelly, you were wondering, Frankie is this species of monkey. Is this called a squirrel monkey? And I wanna remind you to stay tuning in. Eventually we are going to go head on over and see Frankie. But let's go ahead and back up so that way you don't get so much of that glare. And let's check out their neighbors. Now, like I said, we have lots of different types of mammals here in our Riverbanks Conservation Outpost. One of them being our prehensile-tailed porcupines. We're just gonna kind of make our way through the tunnel. Keep your questions coming. It looks like it's kind of a nap session right now. But... <laughs> This is Olive and Richard, our two prehensile tail porcupines. Now prehensile tail porcupines are found in South America. So they are related to our North American porcupines, but they are a little bit different in the sense that they have those big, long tails for climbing. Now they're not necessarily doing it right this second. Oh, Richard is a little bit over there on this side. You see that tail? I'm trying to keep my hand nice and steady for y'all this morning but that tail is kind of wrapped around that branch as an anchor. That is where they get the name prehensile tailed porcupine. So that way they're able to actually anchor themselves. They can actually hang from that tail too. It's very, very strong, but more often than not, they use it as kind of an anchor for support as they're climbing around. Now, Ella, these guys are actually found natively down in South America. They'd be found in kind of a mixed kind of forest environment, almost into rainforest. But these two individuals actually came to riverbanks from other zoos. They didn't come from the wild, of course. These two actually came from other accredited zoos. And they actually, fingers crossed, we'll see. They get to make up the last decision, of course. But they're actually a approved breeding pair. So Richard and Olive, hopefully eventually we'll kick it off and have a little baby porcupine right here at Riverbanks. But like I said, right now they are just napping away this morning. Oh, Megan, H5, what do the porcupines like to eat? Um, well, let's actually take a closer look. They're a little bit closer down here. I know it's not necessarily a view of the porcupines, but let me go ahead and zoom in on what was left over. 
You can see maybe what the porcupines don't like to necessarily dine immediately on. It looks like we got a bit of kale. I see some green beans. I see some squash, broccoli too. So they're eating lots of different types of produce, mainly veggies, mainly root veggies. Um, but I will say just knowing from the keepers that actually work very closely with them, one of their favorite snacks are actually peanuts. They love to eat peanuts. Now, if you've actually seen our clips of Olive actually while she's doing her training session, um, the kind of ASMR clips, the ones of her chewing, um, zoom in on those, she loves to eat whole peanuts. So Tiffany, that's a great question. Let's go ahead and turn it back around on the porcupines. Are they more active at night? A lot of our animals right here in Riverbanks Conservation Outpost are more active at night, absolutely. So right now we might be catching them kind of during their morning nap. They haven't gotten their feed out or their breakfast for today. I can kind of hear our keepers working throughout the rest of the area, but we gotta come on over here because once again, another highly requested animal. Now I'm only gonna pause really, really briefly here, especially because of this big nasty glare. Hopefully you can see though, somebody is really snoozing this morning. This is Coco Joe. He is our two-toed sloth here at Riverbanks. Now, the reason why I'm only pausing briefly at Coco Joe is because we are gonna meet him later this week. We're not just gonna be here in the gallery. We're not just gonna be here on the other side of the glass. We are going to go inside and feed Coco Joe his breakfast. It'll be a very slow, relaxing breakfast, but stay tuned. We'll give you the updates later on in the week. So later this week, it's going to be two toad sloth. Breakfast with Coco Joe. Put it on your radar. We'll let you know exactly what day it is later on. Now, I did see another quick question, though, about our porcupines. Those porcupines, they want to know about those quills. Yes, they have very sharp quills. These quills not, aren't necessarily barbed, like our North American porcupines might have barbed quills to really help them stick in and use for defense. These porcupines, on the other hand, have a little bit smoother of a quill, but regardless of the type of porcupine or where they live in the world, this is what you need to remember. They do not shoot their quills. That is impossible. I want all of you at home right now to imagine if you held your breath and pushed really hard, could you throw the hair out of your head? That'd be the exact same thing for our porcupines. It's impossible. Those quills are truly just modified hairs that act as a defense mechanism to protect them. So no, they can't explode their hairs out of their body. It is impossible. What they do though, is they act as a defense and when they make contact with another animal that maybe gets a little too close for comfort, they actually then fall out and stay in the predator that was trying to make them into a snack. So yes, sometimes an animal might get a mouthful of porcupine quills, but no, they do not shoot them out of their body. It is completely impossible. Naomi, I see your comment. You are so excited about sloth. Let's go ahead and say another quick good morning to Coco Joe. He is definitely snoozing. He'll be a little bit more active later in the week as we feed him breakfast. Now, since all of you are oh so excited about meeting our sloth, all right, you've twisted my arm. I'll go ahead and tell you, we're going to be hanging out with him on Thursday morning. So go ahead and put it on your radar already. Thursday morning, we're going to hang out with our sloth for a very slow breakfast. Oh, y'all are still sending in questions about the porcupines. Heather, what are the porcupines' main threat? What predators would dine on them? Well, porcupines live in South America. Um, which means that things that would dine on them would be small cats, ocelots, for example. Jaguars would love to dine on them as well. Um, but thankfully, since they are very arboreal, they spend a lot of their times up in the trees, um, they're pretty adapted to protect themselves, especially with all of those quills all over their bodies. Let's go ahead and keep making our way down through the tunnel. Like I said, we have the place to ourselves. Hopefully, y'all can see pretty well. Oh, here's one of our small primates that are hanging out over here. These are our white face sake monkeys. Let's go ahead and get a good angle and kind of zoom in just a little bit. Now, our white face sake monkeys also are a South American species. In fact, they would have a range that would actually overlap with those two toad sloths. This individual that we're looking at here is actually our male who's deciding to oh, show us his rear end instead. But maybe I can go ahead and turn our camera around 
And there you can see one of our females as well, hanging out in the back. Now, just from that quick glance over at our male and then our female, you can definitely tell there's quite a difference in color. There's a good view of our boy. Male and female white face sake monkeys kind of both have that white face. The males have that really, really iconic face. But they are what's considered sexually dimorphic. Big word, I know. But imagine animals like songbirds that we find here in South Carolina. Many of them are different, whether it's a boy or a girl, a male or a female. Same is true, say, with lions. Males have the big manes and females don't. Another great example. So you can really tell the difference between boys and girls when it comes to white-faced sake monkeys. Typically their diet though out in the wild is going to consist of fruits, seeds, but they are very opportunistic and like to eat all the things that they can get their hands on, of course, and are considered omnivorous. Let's go ahead and kind of turn this around. Let's see if our glare is gonna be on our side this morning. Perfect, there's a much better view. <laughs> now, just like our porcupine friends. Saki monkeys spend most of their time up in the trees. You can kind of see them both hanging out right now this morning. We're getting a great view of them. Now these are an example of one of the many small South American primates. Once again, you can see the male right here in front with that big bright white face and our female actually hanging out in the back row. Now, those of you who have known riverbanks for a very, very long time, you might actually recognize this face. Maybe not the specific white face Saki monkey, but we actually had an older logo way back when, I wanna say back in the 70s, maybe early 80s, that was actually a white face sake monkey. I'd have to agree with you though, Tiffany, somebody's acting a little camera shy, only giving us the rear end. So let's go ahead and zoom on back and check out their neighbors. Now at first glance, let's go ahead and kind of scan over the habitat. I see some balls on the ground, those blue balls. I see some feathers. Big feathers, I see some woodwill bedding. I see some flowers too, logs, branches. But I don't see a whole lot of animals right now. Do any of you know what habitat we're at right now? How many of you are a really savvy Riverbanks visitor? Do you know what exhibit we're looking at right now? I won't show you the sign, of course. Oh, you might have saw somebody just walk past that behind the scenes doorway. We actually have two individuals of this species. One's hanging out behind the scenes this morning. One's actually on habitat. So we'll see if we can get a, a good view of them here in just a second. And let's go ahead and see. Oh, there we go. I was waiting for somebody to comment in. Megan, you're absolutely right. It is our black-footed cats. Shannon, you got it. It's cats. I know a lot of you have been requesting to learn more about our black-footed cats. Let's go ahead and zoom on in. We don't have much of a view right now, but let's go ahead and see what my camera can go ahead and pull off. Oh, can you kind of see those spots? Somebody was up here just a second ago, but evidently by the time it took me to start our live feature and come on over back over here, somebody decided to get into their hollow log and hide a little bit more. Now these aren't actually our fishing cats. Some of you are really, really close. That's a species further down in the, in the Riverbanks Conservation Outpost, but Elizabeth, you are spot on. This is our black-footed cat. So black-footed cats, that little caboose that we're staring at this morning that's kind of socially distancing away from us right now. You can see the ear too, just over the shoulders. Black-footed cats are very, very small. In fact, this individual is full grown. They're actually typically smaller than your domestic house cat that you find at home. And they're very small, petite, pretty cute too, I would say. but they really do pack a whole lot of personality. Black-footed cats are found in the grasslands and kind of the arid regions of Southern Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa. And they have a whole lot of wild in them. So even though they are very small, seemingly cuddly, our keepers actually don't typically share space with our black-footed cats. More often than not, they'll actually shift them just like they would say our lions and head them into different spaces. Winter was wondering how much does she weigh? This little cat that we're looking at right now here in the tunnel. Let me go ahead and zoom out so you can get a little bit better size reference. Black-footed cats usually weigh anywhere from about three to five pounds a piece. They're very, very petite, um, but they're highly adapted nocturnal predators. So some of you are wondering if the animals are more active at night. This is a great example of one of those animals. 
But Sarah, since you were asking, why do we call them black-footed cats? Well, it's because they actually kind of have black socks on. They have those markings on the bottoms of their feet. Um, they're very, very spotted. We'll kind of back up, see if our individual wants to come out, maybe have a, a better look over here. We can kind of see the whole habitat now. Maybe you'll be able to see one of our other individuals do a drive-by from behind the scenes. But black-footed cats are a very specialized predator. They love to dine on small mammals, birds, and sometimes even large insects as well. It's fascinating to think of all the different things that they can eat. But they are among the smallest species of cat in the world. So when you come to riverbanks, think of it this way. We have the largest cat species, which are our Amur tigers, and then all the way down to the itsy bitsy black-footed cats. That's how big of a range the whole feline family has. And Jenny, I would have to say I agree with you. Somebody is very sleepy this morning. Looks like they're actually kind of awake. Maybe they're resting their eyes. I'd probably say that they're staring over at that doorway right behind the tunnel because that's where the keepers would come in, maybe with a snack, maybe to service the habitat, new enrichment, maybe a new scent or smell. Let's go ahead and see if we can kind of get a closer look over here one more time because I know so many of you have been asking to see our cats. Fran, thank you so much for saying how much you love Riverbanks. We love all of you and so appreciate all of your support for us here at Riverbanks. Even though during our temporary closure, it is amazing to still make these connections with all of you at home. Even if somebody like our black-footed cat isn't so much in the mood to turn around. Let's go ahead and zoom back out and keep heading our way through Riverbanks Conservation Outpost. We got the place to ourselves right now. We're gonna head on over here. Oh my goodness, look at all this enrichment over here. <laughs> so you can see the fresh cut brows, of course, and there's a blue blanket over there, specifically for, maybe you can see them, our golden lion tamarins, which are considered an endangered species here at Riverbanks and actually, more importantly, out in the wild. Let's go ahead, let me try to, bear with me, I'm gonna do a little bit of climbing. Let's get a little bit better of a view. Aha, much better. Somebody is very curious of our camera this morning. Oh, quick before though, we talk about our um, golden lion tamarins. Danica, great question. Can I keep a black-footed cat as a pet at home? No, absolutely not. They are such a wild animal. I'm glad that you asked us though, since we are the experts here at Riverbanks. Black-footed cats are a very, very wild animal, which means that they are just as dangerous <laughs> in some opinions, as lions are. So stick with the domestic cats at home and we'll stick with the dangerous animals here at Riverbanks with our professionals. Let's turn this camera back around. Oh, our golden lion tamarins are wondering what is going on this morning. It has been so long since they've seen visitors. They almost look a little surprised to see us. <laughs> but golden lion tamarins, of course, get their name for that beautiful coat that they have those bright golden hairs with that kind of mane-like appearance as well all over their bodies. They're a gorgeous, tiny primate. They're very, very small, even smaller than our black-footed cats. Now, golden lion tamarins would be found mainly in Central South America, kind of in the Americas, more tropical, so they would definitely be more of a, a forest species. Let's go ahead and zoom back just a little bit more too and see if we can get a better view of all that enrichment that's here in their habitat this morning. Now, our golden lion tamarins are actually considered an endangered species. Thankfully though, from the hard work of zoos all around the world, there have been many, many efforts to actually breed this individual species in human care and then release them back out into the wild, and it's been extremely successful. And we've been able to help support the species and their sustainable populations out in the wild. Let's go ahead and zoom on back. All right, everybody. Nolan, this is for you. We're going to the next habitat. You better still be tuning in because we're at Fishing Cats. Now, I'm taking a peek. I'm looking all around the habitat. Mm, you wouldn't think that I could see much of a fishing cat, but our individual's actually napping right here for you. Oh, we actually might even wake them up on accident. Let's go ahead and zoom in. Everybody has been asking about the fishing cats. They're a very popular species. In fact, let me go ahead and kind of raise up the camera a little bit. Do you see that blob in the background? 
Ooh, a little bit further back, the little bit of spots over there. That's both of our fishing cats. We have a male and female breeding pair. Just like with our porcupines, these two are actually an approved breeding pair, which means that they actually came in from other accredited zoos. So we're fingers crossed, hoping they'll kind of kick it right off, especially because our male was actually born right here at Riverbanks. So he was born, his parents lived here at Riverbanks years ago, and now he has a new mate to hopefully kick it off with. They've been spending a lot of time together, but right now they are snoozing. Let's go ahead and kind of move this around. Oops, somebody just opened up their eyes. Danica, you are asking the question that I think everybody wants to know, so let's go ahead and answer it. How do they get their name, fishing cat? Well, fishing cats actually go fishing. They really, really do. Oh, somebody might go do a big stretch. Oh, look at this. Jamie, you are here for it. Look at this. This is perfect. Ugh. Now, fishing cats get their name, of course, because of that adaptation to go fishing. They have a very, very specialized diet. So they really do fish, and they are cats, of course. So that's how they get their name, fishing cat. Now, if you look at that paw that just got stretched out, you see those really, really sharp claws, just like any other cat species. But what's unique about fishing cats is they are very adapted to spending time in the water, that they actually have semi-webbed feet, kind of like you would see like on a duck's foot that has that webbing so that way they can paddle better. Fishing cats have that same sort of adaptation so that way they can kind of push the water a little bit better. So once again, just like our black-footed cat, our fishing cats are very potentially dangerous animal, meaning our keepers do not spend time sharing space with them. They absolutely give them their personal space and they shift them just like our other big cats. So they are wild, dangerous, and do not make good pets. But fishing cats, they do mostly eat fish. Sarah, that was a great question to ask. In fact, let me go ahead and kind of step back here a second. You can kind of see in the rest of the habitat, you can see all the rocks all around. But this water area actually gets pretty deep. We can fill it up much deeper than it is right now. They can kind of drain it and change it. So that way it's different for the cats on any given day. But every week we actually feed our fishing cats live fish. So they put the fish right into here into the water. And let's see if we can zoom into our other fishing cat. There's a good view, perfect. Our fishing cats actually do then go swimming for their live fish. Now, it's not the only thing that they eat. They do get other meats, of course, but being a cat, they only like to eat meats. Cara, age seven, do they meow like other cats? They absolutely do. They meow, they purr, which is those noises that those big cats can't make. They much prefer to roar, of course. There's another great view of our friend that's hanging out over here. Now, where are fishing cats from? Fishing cats are found in a very specific spot of Southeast Asia, kind of in those rainforested environments. They are considered an endangered species, so it's very important that we have them and can care for them here. Oh, Gabby, I'm sorry, I just completely skirted over their names. Our fishing cats are Gilligan and Nampom. So our female is Nampom, and Gilligan is our male who was born right here at Riverbanks. And Nafam actually came to us from another accredited zoo. She actually came to us from the Denver Zoo out in Colorado. Big shout out to her team at Denver, where she's actually raised kittens before. So she is a successful, very proud mother, of course. But after those kittens got old enough to head out on their own, that's when she came to live here at Riverbanks. Ooh, Robert, I love that idea of doing a feature of them eating and fishing on their own. We might have to get that on the schedule so that way y'all can see them really in action. Holy smokes, Jamie, thank you so much for bringing my attention. I just noticed how much money we've raised this morning. We've already raised $125 just through two different donations. I'm sorry I didn't catch the names for those different donations that came in live. Y'all are amazing for doing that. Thank you so much, I'm sorry. Jamie, thank you for catching me on that. That was fantastic that you saw that. So now that we got a very good view of our fishing cats, oh, somebody's looking up over here. Let's go ahead and turn it around one more time. Fran, you're absolutely right. It is such a fantastic shot. Somebody woke up, turned around, and is not being camera shy whatsoever. So let's go ahead and zoom in on that fishing cat face. Oh, what a great view. 
Ooh, Matthew, that is a great question that I actually don't have the answer for. Matthew is wondering who's who, which one's Namphon and which one's Gilligan. I wanna say this is Namphon right here, but it is very challenging for me to tell when I don't have both of their sizes to compare. Because all of our animals have their own kind of unique appearances, coloration, size, behaviors too. And sometimes they're a little challenging to tell apart, even for us here that work at Riverbanks. Oh, Cynthia, I did just catch your donation. Thank you so much for donating to Riverbanks. We are now up to $135. Y'all are amazing. Thank you so much. I want to say that's Gilligan hanging out in the back right there. Oh, April, you are absolutely right. They are such a gorgeous species. Once again, native to Southeast Asia, kind of in those wetland habitats. Oh, that's definitely our female. Now that she's setting up, I can definitely tell. Let's go ahead and zoom in on her. So all of you who've been requesting for fishing cats, whew, we have delivered. The fishing cats decided to wake up from their naps this morning just in time for Z learning. Take a look at that beautiful cat. You can see those spots, those kind of stripes all through their body too. <laughs> Mason was wondering why are the rocks in the shape of an eight? I have a feeling, I can't confirm this. I think somebody recently celebrated an eighth birthday. We might have to double check on that though for you. I might just be making that up, but that's gonna be my guess is that the keepers did that to celebrate somebody's eighth birthday. Oh, what a beautiful animal. Once again, this is our fishing cat here at Riverbanks. And all of you who are wondering, yes, they do go fishing. No, not with a pole and a line and a hook. They go fishing with their claws and their teeth and they don't mind getting a whole lot of wet to do so. They are very, very good at fishing. Oh, Rachel, I did just catch your donation too. Thank you so much for donating to Riverbanks. Y'all are rock stars. $155, that is amazing. Y'all, thank you so much. <laughs> Caleb, you are too funny. They, of course, don't hold a fishing pole, but maybe you could kind of picture that later today. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna keep on heading through our tunnel, say goodbye to our fishing cats, and head on over to their neighbors, which are Matchy's tree kangaroos. Who? oh, which are just waking up this morning. Perfect timing, or maybe just stretching for a second. We have two Matchy's tree kangaroo. We have a male and a female pair here. Let's go ahead and zoom back. Let's see if we can find that other individual. I think they're actually, oop, they might be just out of view. But y'all are getting a great view of all this fresh browse. Our keepers went ahead and trimmed all these different leaves and branches, so that way everybody can have some fresh browse to either chew on scent mark on or actually just kind of hang out near there we go there's a much better view of her matches tree kangaroo now tree kangaroos just like their name entails they are a kangaroo they are directly related to our other marsupials here at the zoo like our wallabies and our kangaroos let's go ahead and get a closer look bear with me it's going to be a little rocky ride here for a second a uh, much better view there we go now, Matchy's tree kangaroos are found in a very unique part of the world. They're found in Papua New Guinea. If you don't know where Papua New Guinea is, take out a map, find a new place in the world. It is a fascinating island in Southeast Asia, actually just north of Australia. But tree kangaroos have that long tail, just like other kangaroos. But of course, they are more adapted for life in the trees and for climbing. They have very strong hands and limbs to get from place to place. And they really do have very sharp claws too. Now, Matchy's tree kangaroos are considered endangered and we've actually cared for them here at Riverbanks almost since Riverbanks opened. Oh, quick comment. Oh, Anna, you caught a new donation. Oh my gosh, you're right. They are just coming in left and right. I'm too busy talking about our tree kangaroos to say thank you, you all. I just, I'm floored. $165 for live this morning on a Monday. You all are amazing. We really do appreciate your support for our mission here at Riverbanks. Oh, look at those little ears perking up. Now, tree kangaroos are considered endangered. Like I mentioned, we've cared for them for many, many, many years. In fact, we've had multiple births here at Riverbanks. We don't have any currently, but we definitely are hopeful because once again, this is an approved pair because it makes sense. We're in the Riverbanks Conservation Outpost. 
These are all these different approved breeding recommendation. Leslie, I did catch your donation though. You are amazing. You brought us up over $200. Oh, let's go ahead and kind of come back over here. See if we can get a better angle. Oh my goodness, I need to zoom out. <laughs> there we go. You can get a whole view. It looks like the other individual is going to be snoozing on over there. But they are extremely agile. I know it's hard to picture because they are snoozing right now. But tree kangaroos are actually known to jump up to 30 feet in one big, huge leap, which is an amazing feat for such a highly adapted animal. Oh, somebody is deciding to kind of huddle back down and rest. All right, let's go ahead and back up on over here to our neighbors, one of our last areas actually here in the conservation outpost. We're gonna do a quick big overview. You might see some characters kind of zipping all around, but we are focusing on one particular individual. We're looking for Frankie, because we are over here at our squirrel monkey habitat. And I know all of you have been wondering where is one of our newest Riverbanks babies. And he is hanging out in the back. He's been zipping all around. I know one of the last times we gave you an update, there he is, there is Frankie. Frankie is probably not gonna hold still very well. We're gonna see. Merritt, thank you so much for donating. I just saw that you brought us up again. Oh my goodness, look at all these squirrel monkeys. <laughs> oh, they are cracking me up. Sorry for all of you who are still asking questions about the kangaroos. I am just so distracted now by Frankie. Look at that sweet face. I know you have to kind of look through the bamboo leaves, but this is Frankie, our juvenile squirrel monkey here at Riverbanks. Look at those ears. A lot of people have been claiming that he looks like baby Yoda. I would probably have to agree with that. Now, Frankie is a couple of months old, and if you can't tell, he is very independent. He is hanging off of mom. He is not just being carried around all the time anymore like he used to be. In fact, I don't even know where his mother is, to be honest. She's probably taking a break right now. But all of our different individuals here in our squirrel monkey troop have a part in taking care of him. Ed, I did not miss your donation though. Thank you so much for supporting Riverbanks' mission. Our squirrel monkeys really appreciate it. Absolutely they do. <laughs> here, let me zoom back a little bit. We gotta see this individual a little bit better. Squirrel monkeys are very, very quick. So hopefully you all don't get car sick while we're going through this today because we are all over the place. Here is Frankie though. Frankie's our individual right here on our front road. We kind of have a rocky view. Frankie's just a couple months old. He was actually born here at Riverbanks, which is a part of, once again, those breeding recommendations. Oh, he is just zipping all around. Let me go ahead and zoom back so that way y'all don't get too motion sickness. Abby, what a good point. We have almost <laughs> done $300 worth of donations in less than just 30 minutes. Our Riverbanks community is absolutely astounding. You all make all the difference. So that way we can create these connections, we can inspire actions, and all together we can impact conservation. Check out those squirrel monkeys, those. They are zipping all around. They are very agile primate species. Once again, these primates are found in South America. They are adult size. Well, except for Frankie, I should say. Reagan donated as well. Oh my gosh, you all are so 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 grateful of all of your donations and i say that from all of us here at riverbanks including our squirrel monkey troop now our keepers must have already been over here in this area i have no doubt about it because there is a whole lot of fresh food that everyone is snacking on hopefully you can get a good view through that bamboo oh megan i just heard that you got the riverbanks south carolina strong t-shirts i can't wait for you to wear them out and about too Oh, stay safe, everybody. Debbie, thank you so much for donating. We've exceeded $300. Shannon, you got it. 335 to be specific. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. I'm so glad we added the donate button this morning because all of that is going to go back to support Riverbanks and our mission. And during our temporary closure, this is so, so important for us. Pat, thank you. Thank you for your live donation here this morning. We're kind of zoomed back over here. We're at our squirrel monkey habitat, which is one of our last areas that we're actually going to be focusing on here this morning. Our squirrel monkeys are all enjoying a special, special treat. Let's go ahead and get a closer look. They're kind of staying around, so I'm brave enough to zoom back in. Once again, here's your update on Frankie, the squirrel monkey. 
as he kind of starts to zip out of view. <laughs> Here, hold on everybody. There we go. That's a much better view of Frankie. Right as he moves away. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I just cannot keep up with our squirrel monkeys. They are way too active, zipping all around. They're very agile, and they are so highly adapted for that life up in the trees. Y'all, I am so glad we were able to get a good view of Frankie. We got to say good morning to so many different of our Riverbanks Conservation Outpost residents, but we have one more habitat to go see. I didn't want to skip them. I know we talked about the lemurs at the beginning, right at 10 a.m., but we have some bigger lemurs over here to say good morning to, and they are hanging out this morning too. In fact, in a little bit of a sunshine spot. Let's turn around this camera. Oh, big stretch. Look at those red rough lemurs. Now these are those very, very noisy individuals. They have quite the iconic call. But now that, guys, this is a great example of just how different lemurs can look. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, very small, much smaller than these, and there's actually lemurs that are bigger than these red rough lemurs. Now, red rough lemurs, of course, get that name from that big bushy coat, the red in color fur. Now, they have those very complex alarms. Oh, Simone, thank you so much for donating as well. Oh, Anna, since you were wondering here, let's get a better angle over here. This is our two, our pair of red rough lemurs. Oh, Anna, you know about the stink fighting of lemurs? I am so impressed. They stink fight as a way to show dominance and to kind of establish a territory. Lemurs are so unique in the sense that they rely so heavily on scent, scent marking, and really displaying. Anna, I love that you knew that fun fact about lemurs. You are so smart. You must love animals as much as we do here. Oh, Harris, perfect timing for your comment about what is tomorrow's animal going to be. Oh my goodness, I have to remember, we have all of everything all set up for the entire week. Tomorrow's animal, though, is going to be our Galapagos tortoises. I know we actually started Z-learning with them way back when. Oh, pause. Kelly, thank you for donating $380. Y'all are just flooring me this morning. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your donation. And tomorrow, we're going to be hanging out with our oldest residents here at Riverbanks, our Galapagos tortoises. And when I say oldest, they are hands down the oldest. They are well over a hundred years each and we're going to have a nice slow start to the morning with them. Leslie, you're wondering about those stink fights? Go ahead and give it a quick Google search. Just make sure to include ring-tailed lemur and then stink fight and you can learn something new about those amazing animals. Let's go ahead and end though with an amazing view of our squirrel monkeys yet again. Frankie's still hanging out in the back, but we have an individual right here having a big old snack as they crawl through under the bamboo. Oh, Donna, I saw your comment. Do we all still have slots? We absolutely do. In fact, join us on Thursday morning and we'll do a whole feature just on our two toad sloths. Thank you all so much though for tuning in live. It was amazing to see all of you this Monday morning, $380 donated to support Riverbanks' mission right here at Z Learning. Oh, 390 now. Darcy, you are phenomenal. Oh, I cannot say thank you enough for supporting Riverbanks' mission right here in Columbia, South Carolina. Let's go ahead and zoom back out and give a big old thank you from Riverbanks, our entire family, and... We hope to see all of you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We're going to be hanging out with our Galapagos tortoises. But before I sign off, Cindy, I saw your donation. You're a rock star. We have $400 that we raised for Riverbanks in about 30 minutes. Y'all support us so much. We wouldn't be here without an amazing community supporting us. Thank you, thank you from the bottoms of our heart. And we will see you tomorrow morning, everybody.